Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone globally. Thank you, thank you so very much for being with WOCPSEN, Women of Concerned Professionals and Strategic Conscious Networking. I am founder and CEO and everything else that no one else wants to do, I do it. And we welcome you. Um, on behalf of WCPSEN again, I would like to thank you for entering this journey of healing of we the people are darker than blue, the Lena Baker DV and Women's Health Summit. This is our second year. You can watch what we discussed last year on our website and also at our LinkedIn page and on our YouTube page, which is WCP TV. Now, this summit is based on the intersectionality of Miss Baker's life, who is one of the only women in Georgia to be executed by electrocution. That took place on March 5th, 1945. Now given a, a posthumous pardon, however, Miss Baker's life exemplifies intersectionalities that still plague women of color today. Today, this is series two of our four part series. Our title today is This is My Country. When they share their care, will we consider the physical and psychological ramifications behind that, the trauma of racism? Now, WOCPSEN and the Lena Baker Domestic Violence and Women's Health Summit is considered a safe place to express oneself. So let us be mindful respectful and allow thought to transition. Although we may not agree with what is being said, allow the individual to complete their thoughts and express their opinion as you have given the grace to express yours. Those given opportunity of expression, please be mindful of time, that the opinion of our guest panelists are their opinion. And it may not be the opinion of WOCPS Board of Trustees, founder, founding members, affiliate members, partners, or associates, but we honor their discussion. So let us use the chat box to allow additional conversations to move forward and enhance continued conversations as we collectively find our place through this conversation. Now, we would also like you to understand that we must be in some level of agreement. So let us agree by saying cache, Yes, amen, and thank you. I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, wonderful Vanessa Johnson, whose mission is to help women take a bold shift and how they show up from opportunities while remaining authentic and incredibly powerful. Now, Ms. Johnson is lead instructor for a professional development program at Berkeley Global in Berkeley, California. California. She has successfully moved participants from an academic orientation to a workplace orientation while she curates and designs course content that reflects current work, workplace cultures and workforce trends. We are excited to have Ms. Johnson with us. And as our moderator, Ms. Johnson, take it away. Thank you, thank you. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are joining us in the world. I am really honored to be here to moderate this discussion. It is such a powerful topic that we don't talk enough about. So I, def I definitely want to give honor and acknowledgement to WOCPSCN for just taking the stance and the courage to be bold enough to create an event such as this um, and activities following the event to be able to bring voice to um, domestic violence. So thank you so much. And we're gonna move right into our discussion today because I am really honored as well to have you to meet as I have met the amazing Desheen L. Evans. I am going to read a bit of her bio and I'm also going to drop her company info into the chat. So if you would like to learn more about Desheen, um, and especially you're gonna definitely wanna connect with her, 
probably doing and after this this uh, this presentation that she's going to share with us you will have her contact information to reach out to her you also will be able to share her contact information with people in your network because we don't know what we need until we realize we need something so be prepared to share that and i will be checking the chat um we are going to have um Desheen is going to talk for a bit uh, she's got three topics that she's going to cover today so she's going to talk for a bit and then i will be checking the chat and i will be asking and pulling in some of those questions um we recognize that we may not be able to get everyone's question you know answered during this session hence why you want to reach out and connect with her afterwards but i will definitely try and and get as many questions in as we can and some questions um, may require deeper answers, you know, that need to be addressed outside of this discussion. So, um, but please know that that information is going to go to Desheen and um, she'll be able to respond to you. So just wanted to lay those housekeeping rules. All right, now, so let's get started. I'm going to read um, a part of Desheen's bio. Again, I'm going to put the link in the chat and you can um, check out her information and go a little deeper dive with it. So Desheen, so glad to have you here. So Desheen Evans is the founder of Chief, is founder and Chief Operating Officer of the Eyes of Power Trauma Coach Company. Desheen has over 30 years experience working with city funded agencies, trauma embedded communities, and independently contracts with personal injury lawyer firms, helping them and their client combat trauma. Desheen has had her own experience with trauma and her collective experiences give her the insights needed to identify hidden trauma to create and facilitate training that trainings that are sensitive and coined from real case studies to best match the needs of all of those that she serves. So without further ado, please welcome Ms. Desheen Evans. And Desheen, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Nisi. Hello, everyone, and thank you for taking time out today to be here with us. Um, so I'm going to start with a brief overview about trauma, because so many times, um, you know, you will hear, um, well, I don't believe that that's a traumatic experiencing. And so basically trauma is based on the individual, how that individual perceives trauma, because what may be uh, traumatic to that individual may not be perceived as trauma to the next person, but that is that person's trauma. Um, just a, a quick example of that, for example, a car accident. Um, you know, I often hear that a lot and I'll say to clients because they say, oh, I'm tra traumatized because I had a car accident. And so for me, it's really identifying what is the trigger of that trauma? Is it that the color of the car, the make of the car, the airbags explode? Because every time you see a car, it should not prompt you into a trauma. But if you don't really understand what the triggers are, so it's being able to identify that and kind of help the individual that, to understand that not everything needs to be trauma, but however, at that given moment, that is still that person's trauma and we must respect it as such. Moving forward, um, I wanted to cover... Uh, Desheen, this, this this may I jump in for a moment? If you're joining us, please make sure you mute your mics, please. Please make sure you mute your mic because we can hear the background noise. Thank you so much. Okay, Desheen, turning it back over to you. Okay. Um, the next area that I wanted to touch on was, um, I have a site actually, it's called Colorful Trauma. Because so many times uh, we say, does trauma have a color? I believe that it does. And so specifically, Black trauma. I'm going to stay there as a woman of color and not to say that one trauma is different from the other, but it is the collective identities alongside of that cultural trauma, which is the black trauma. And so um, when we look at what are some of the collective identities that go into it. So when we know trauma embedded communities, the media experiences, 
behaviors and it's all those kind of things. And it's not to say that other cultures don't have that. However, when people of color experience the trauma, they tend to mask what some identify as um, hidden trauma. It's uh, silent sufferers, it's all one and the same. And so, you know, for me, it's how are you managing? And so if they don't really have that place to go to of comfort and not everyone, especially people of color, wants to sign up for mental health, but does it mean that they should not be able to get the assistance that they need? Because again, you have to understand Black trauma and the collective identities. And so, for example, what I mean to round this up is if, okay, we have COVID that's going on, uh, crimes very high in um, poor communities, um, things that happen right where you are. So, for example, um, in my building, you know, I had someone that was murdered. I've never lived anywhere in my entire life where someone was murdered. And, you know, I listened, no one was moving. The building was really, really silent. And that's what we call silent sufferers. And so as, you know, a week or two, people kind of went on about their business, but they remember that, which pushes me into the re-traumatization piece and the behaviors. When you have uh, traumatic experiences, um, you have every right to uh, mourn the loss of your loved one, seek justice, but you have to think about how your behavior can potentially be the onset to someone else's trauma. That could be uh, the behavior of you cutting on the news, of you sharing a specific story, or if someone, like for example, with my building, when you put a bunch of flowers and roses and then you come back next year with that, I personally, I don't wanna be reminded of that. It was horrific. And again, for me, I've never ever experienced anything like that. And so you'll have people in communities, trauma-embedded communities that you feel that pain, you're uncomfortable, but you don't really know who to talk to because you don't want to get into a battle with people, but these are your feelings. And so it's, how do you really address that? Because at some point what happens is it becomes a domino effect. And sometimes it can be what I like to call emotionally immunity, like you're immune to it. So you just accept it as a norm, like what they say, the new normal, there's nothing normal about that because it does take a toll. And at some point you're going to explode. And so for me, based on these things, I've created a lot of programs that resonate with people that they can really be comfortable coming to me so that we can work on that because you cannot go through life and just walk around with that and feel that it's normal because there's nothing normal about it. Um, if there are any questions for me, I'm happy to answer. Great thing. I'm, I'm watching the chat on it, Desheen. Okay. So, so far, Terrence has commented that not all traumas, that some traumas do seem different. Yeah, that's exactly what, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Because again, what may be traumatic to one person may not be traumatic to another person. I mean, I... You know, I can use myself again as an example. I'm I'm terrified. I go into a frenzy if I if I see a roach with someone else. My oh, you scared of a little roach? You know, just step on it. But that is my trauma. Yeah, and I like the fact that you are sharing real life, everyday examples because we take for granted. You know, we really do take for granted, which you know is one of the triggers that can you know send someone in a mental mental health state. It could really send them over the edge because we don't know what that trauma is associated with. So, you know, we do get to be gentle and kind with each other and, mm -hmm. you know, be open to ask more questions. If someone says, I'm afraid of a roach, you could say, wow, so tell me, tell me about that, you know, versus, you know, judging them, <laughs> which I think is what we automatically do in our community, right? If somebody exactly. is, if somebody has a challenge, 
uh, an issue with something, we just start, oh, you need to get over that. You need to get past that. Right. And it shuts the person down. Uh, and they keep and it and they keep reliving and they're not getting, you know, the support of the help or it keeps them from getting the support of the help because they may think, well, if that person thinks this way, other people think that way. Right. So mm-hmm. I, I, I like the fact that you you shared that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank mm-hmm. you for that. Um, I know that, um, you know, there are a lot of experts in the field mm-hmm. and I can't stress this enough is that um, you have to really really understand people of color unless you absolutely just cannot work with them. And, and I stress that because there are times that, for example, a person, a person of color, if they're expressing, right, this is how they express themselves. It doesn't mean that that person is angry. This is the only way that they know how to express themselves through the trauma that they are going through. But because you don't understand that brings in the fear that shuts the persons down and they feel that you are like psychoanalyzing them, judging them. Cause I've had people say that to me, you know, Desheen, you're very angry or I'm, I'm not angry. I'm expressing exactly how I feel. Yeah. Or the deep breathing. I want to go into that a little bit because it ties right into that. Um, I don't ever say that deep breathing does not work. What I do feel strongly about is that it's not a one size fit all. Yeah. And again, when you're dealing with people of color in low income areas, trauma embedded communities, um, you know, and I'm very straightforward about that. <sighs> Deep breathing, that's not really on the top of my agenda. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, um, I don't have the luxury of family that have a vacation cabinet we can go to on a weekend <laughs> right. go in my backyard on a ham hop go horseback riding i mean this is just being real when it, I go it is ride, i know i may have to dodge a bullet i may go into the supermarket and they start shooting so my breathing is for running yeah Duck, yeah staying yeah. safe yeah you know Every time I get on a train, there's something going on. I'm so happy that they stepped up the police and on a train, it needs to be there. But this is what people of color in these kind of communities that they experience on a daily basis. And so when you are daily dealing with this, how do you cope and able to really function? You cannot continue to mask that. Yeah, you bring up a good point on that, Desheen. And I want to go back to a couple of things that you shared on there. And then we've got a question um, that's in the chat discussion as well. So you mentioned just about coping mechanisms, you know, are different for other individuals. And I think that's really important to recognize, you know, even being part of our community when we look at or we're responding to, you know, somebody that is demonstrating some form of trauma to us is to not placate that as to, oh, you just need to go take a time out. Oh, you just need to go breathe, you know, as you're saying, because Mm -hmm. we don't know if that's really the best kind of mechanism for them, Mm -hmm. you know, or perhaps we may be ushering them back into trauma-filled environments. You know, just like you said, you know, you, you, you know, step, you don't have that hammock in the backyard, you know, to, you know, relax or that, that getaway home, you know, to go to. So you bring up a good point, you know, in being compassionate as well as being mindful, you Mm -hmm. know, so, you know, perhaps maybe asking the person, what is it that they need? How can you help? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, it's, it's simple sometimes, but because we're, in our own trauma, responding to somebody with trauma. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sometimes Absolutely. it's sometimes it's hard. And I want to move to the second part about the angry black woman. So I'm so glad to see that in the comment. Um, when is anxiety identified as angry black woman? Is that a question for That's me? A question. Just, yes, Desheen. Yes. I'm sorry. Can you repeat? So, I thought sure. that was that's okay. That's okay. That in the chat. What was that again? Yeah. So when is anxiety identified as angry black woman? When? Yeah, when? When whenever we speak about things that we're going through. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> very straightforward answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because that came uh, up for me as well, too, is how does that 
that tie into um, the angry black woman. And I put this in quotations, right? That yeah. label that mm -hmm. has been created, you know? So how does mm -hmm. trauma tie into that? How does the, you know, um, one, let me just go back a little bit. Mm -hmm. The black woman or the black man with all of the things that are going on in their community and it hits home, they have absolutely every right in the world to be angry. Mm. That is their feeling. They have a right to vent because this is the only way that they know. However, what I say to people is that when you have these kind of situations, you have every right to be angry, but it's how you respond. And that is something that we, as people of color, women and men, that we got to work on and also stop being the crabs in a barrel. Because if we want other cultures to really kind of understand us, then we can't be going at each other. We got to mm. learn to be more compassionate to one another. Yeah, you know, I do definitely acknowledge and agree on that. Um, because I think compassion is something that we all have access, you know, to share with others, but even with ourselves before we share with others. I think that's an important point is recognizing our own trauma. And Absolutely. when we recognize our own trauma and trauma doesn't have a scale. You said that to Sheen in a sense, and I'm paraphrasing. It doesn't have a scale to say this trauma is greater than. <laughs> that trauma is trauma. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's trauma is trauma. So I think just recognizing within ourselves where mm -hmm. we may be experiencing trauma and really kind of acknowledging that, that trauma and the impact it could be having on us individually. And this leads into Aiden's point. Aiden made a, a question slash comment. He says, Venice, how do you separate your trauma from others? Is there experiences or are there experiences so similar to yours or someone's close to you? If their experience experiences so similar to yours, you know, or someone close to you, how do you separate your trauma from them? So we're not trauma bonding. Uh, that's right on. So that is what we would call re-traumatization. Mm. Um, for me, uh, and I'm not saying that in a bad way or sure. showing off kind of way, mm -hmm. but uh, in the business side, having my own business, I get to kind of select which clients that I want to work with because sometimes it may be a bit much for me. When it's just uh, average folks, I, I'm going to use myself. Mm -hmm. I have some great colleagues of mine. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I'll go and we're talking and I'm venting, but what I'm really doing is dumping my trauma on you. Mm, wow. And one day, they pointed that out. They said, you know, Tasheen, I got a lot of love for you, but sometimes it's just too much. Mm. And it was that that helped me to start doing more personal assessments. Wow. Because maybe I'm throwing too much on this person. And I started using that and I implemented it as a tool. When do we know when we've reached our mental health ceiling? Wow. So um, for me, I, I, I have... I categorize people. It's like, you know, if you're going on a diet, they have a plate and you separate it, you eat this much, you eat this much. And this is what I do with people. Like Venice is really cool, but sometimes my sister just got a lot too much going on. If I don't have a lot going on on Friday, I'll call Venice on Friday. This individual, they always got something on. When I absolutely have nothing else to do, which is very rarely, then I'll reach out to them. And you have to do that because if you're no good to yourself, then you cannot help someone else. And sometimes we have to step back and, but it's, I don't like to hurt people's feelings. Yeah. So it's finding that balance that I'm not brushing you off and not to hurt the person's feelings. And if it's one of those individuals that no matter what you say, they're just not going to get it or they're just not, you know, I have folks like that too, that I just totally block them. And again, mm -hmm. it's not in a bad way, but I have to maintain this little sanity that I have left because I have work to do. You know, um, 
listen, Denise, um, I, you know, I was passing by and I bumped into this blah, blah, blah. You should call them. I think they will be a great resource for you. So I'm putting you down, but not, it, I'm, I'm, I'm moving you somewhere else, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. not in a bad way because I, my goal is not to be offensive to you. But I also know realistically, Desheen cannot take on the world. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I hope that kind of answers uh, speak to that. So Aiden, you dropped that question for us. Thank you so much for dropping that in there. How does, does that answer, you know, kind of in the way Aiden that you were, you know, that was, is that the kind of answer, you know, that you were seeking? You know, I love that. Um, that in Terrence, I'm going to come to you. I love that, uh, Desheen, when you said that the, the visual of the plate, you mm -hmm. know, is really looking at, you know, and, and, and having some boundaries, you know, having some boundaries because you, you can be re-traumatized. <laughs> you can be traumatized. You could be creating trauma bonds, you know, with people. And it's just kind of keeps you in that space, you know, of that. Um, so Ada, let me know if that works. And if I'm not saying your name correctly, please, you know, um, teach me how to say your name. And then I want to go to Terrence and I want to circle back on one more thing, Desheen, before we continue on the topic. So Terrence, you had a question or a comment. First of all, for more reasons than one, I really, I don't know if anyone else in the audience feels this way, but I really want to thank you mm. uh, for this meeting because this is our meeting. Mm -hmm. This is the way I feel. And sometimes you look for these kind of meetings, but it's not your meeting, just like it's not your trauma. Yeah, yeah. Or we talk about, you know, all traumas are not the same. And I say this also after hearing Desheen speak, you know, she made some wonderful comments. You know, just the statement alone that she made about deep breathing, mm -hmm. the different approaches that people give, you know, as though it's canon law. You know, this is the way <laughs> right, you, right. you're supposed to do it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And if you don't do it that way, then, you know, and that leads into my second point about in which uh, Sheen spoke to, which we have to talk about when we're talking about our trauma. We have to talk about spaces and cultural competency versus unskilled and unqualified people. Because just because you have a degree you know, or you're a certain skin color or a certain uh, position or something like that. And the problem with that is, is oftentimes when people say, oh, well, you should go to therapy, we know that all therapy or therapists don't work for certain people. It's almost like maybe the person is not doing something right because they don't go to a particular uh, uh, therapist. You know, mm -hmm. we know that can be very difficult to mm -hmm. find the other point I wanted to mention, I know these are a lot of points, but I was writing notes actually <laughs> while Desheen was talking because she was hitting on some, some really home points. Is that we have to be very, very careful of how our pain, our troubles, and our trauma uh, benefits and profits other people. Mm. People come into our neighborhoods, people want to find out what's wrong with, with us but they are the ones who profit from it. And it also re-traumatizes us a lot of times. And if you speak out about it and talk about how it's not helping you, then you know you might have a whole another set of problems. This is very, very uh, important. You know, you judge by how you comply, you know, subject or submit to um, others' uh, response to your trauma. You know, you should not have to comply to how someone says, oh, I'm going to help you. It's about you. It's not about them. Yeah. And then the last thing I wanted to say that I really, really appreciate you both uh, for is that when we have in these discussions, once again, language and voice is very important. Yes. You know, I could sit here and I, even if I wasn't looking at her face on this uh, screen, Mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, I can relate as maybe you can relate. I can relate to what Desheen was saying just by her language, mm -hmm. just by her voice. And that in itself uh, is, is, is therapeutic and healing. Yeah. 
Thank you so much, Terrence, for that. That was really great uh, points. And thank you for taking notes <laughs> and, and sharing those. so notes. good. I had to. <laughs> <laughs> good, 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 good. Thank you. Um, so, Desheen, I'm going to let you, you know, just kind of respond to maybe some things that stood out and what Terrence shared, um, you know, with us. And Terrence, Ian, Aiden, and anyone that's catching the replay, um, we are just thankful. We are very thankful that this platform, you know, this event is bringing some value and mm -hmm. bringing a space, bringing a space, you know, for us to have this conversation. Okay. I kind of wanted to piggyback on it. It takes me right into that again. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm very straightforward. I don't bite my tongue, but I just do it. I'd stay professional. Um, you have to really understand us and we are not here for you to try to make money off of us right? We are not your guinea pigs. And so this brings me into um, a little example. I have a LinkedIn uh, newsletter that I started. And I have almost 7,000 subscribers and I just started. It's called Black Leaders Without Limits. But I open it up to people that are not of color if you believe in the mission, because I don't shouldn't cope. And that brings me into the diversity piece. I hear this a lot. And I had to blow some people up about that very nicely, because when you say diversity and inclusion, we are really going back to our fellow, our fallen brother, um, George uh, Floyd. Mm -hmm. That's when a lot of companies, they're so diverse now and blah, 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 blah. And so when I hear that, the first thing that I will do is I go to your website. And when I go to your website and I see a bunch of light-skinned folks, that's not being diverse. And we got to be real about that because you can't help me if you don't know anything about me. And I'm very clear about that. I don't care what you read on the internet. You will not be able to help, truly help a person of color if you don't understand us. I don't care if you grew up with people of color and you went to school with black people. I've heard it all. And those are real conversations that we have to have because I am not here for you to test, test me or try to psychoanalyze me. You know, people of color, we have real issues, but we need people that are like us to better understand us. And this is why I resonate with people because every single day that I go outside, I find one person to talk to. I do it every single day. My mom, she used to get so upset with me, but she understood because this is something that I constantly, how you doing my sister? Happy Monday. You need a cup of coffee or something? Even with the guy, listen, don't pull out your phone. I'm not trying to date you. I'm just trying to offer you a cup of coffee. How you doing today? Or they upset, what's going on? And I'll stop and I'll talk to them because sometimes they just need that. Some people may think I talk a lot, but I know somewhere in there, there's a message that can help you. You know, and, and it's to kind of get us to really think, because sometimes we will dive without a parachute. And when we hit the ground, we realize it's too late, you know? Yeah. So yeah. this is just real quick. Mm -hmm. I had a delivery that was scheduled for yesterday. New stove, fridge, I'm waiting after a week, back and forth. They, they delivered it to the wrong address. Really? Home Depot. Call, I'm on the phone an hour and a half. I want my money back. What do you mean that I can't get my money back? I have to wait. I was tempted to go to the store, right? Now that's the old machine. Sure, I could have went into the store, trashed the store. And even though I'm right, this makes me wrong. Right. You destroy their property, right? I know I have this event today. This is the kind of media exposure that I want. Not that I was arrested in Home Depot because I tore up the store. I'm still not going to have the stove or the fridge on Rackers Island. And it is to get people to think. You can be angry, but again, it goes back to your behavior. This is where the angry Black woman comes in. That's why they say that, and we have to stop that. I know what they did was wrong, but now I have a case number, and I'm taking it a step further, Better Business Bureau, because what you should have done as customer loyalty was, well, you know, we're going to issue maybe like a $500 credit or whatever, and we'll make arrangements to have it delivered first thing in the morning. Not you rescheduling 
on the first for me without consulting with me with what I have to do. And so I was insulted by that. But I wasn't going to let that take up my, no, I'm looking forward to today. This is just, I'm helping people. I went to the store this morning. I have no fridge, no stove. You'll be okay. You've been eating out. This too shall pass. And sometimes we have to think things through. But if I had gone outside and let's say Denise was just answering a text and she bumped me by mistake, I would call her a bunch of bees. This is my sister. Yeah. Because yeah. something else is going on and I didn't have an outlet. Mm. And we an outlet a positive outlet within our communities because when you try to go outside of your community that's when you are labeled as the angry black person and that is not so you're going through something yeah you bring up some really great points um on that i got chills i have chills um and i just want to kind of highlight a couple of points to shane that you brought up um, the biggest of them all is we need an outlet. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about the angry black woman um, and that that persona that's been put out there, right? When you talk about that, um, and you mentioned thinking things through, you know, thinking things through. Mm -hmm. So so let, I'm gonna put this question out there. This may be on somebody's mind. So what suggestions do you have? Because this is your area of expertise, and you all, I just want to share. Uh, Dasheen has so many great certifications, you know, and, and who she is and what she does. So I dropped her website links in the chat, go back and review when you have a chance, but she's not only speaking from her experience, but she's speaking from her education. <laughs> so I just want to make sure that we acknowledge her for that. So when we're, as a Black woman, and when we're in those spaces that trigger us, it triggers that trauma up for us. And, you know, you suggested just take a moment, right? Just think through, right? What can help us before we get to the think through? So it's kind of something between the traumas, it's, it's triggered us and the think through is on this side. So is there something in between that can help us to get to the think through so that we can show up the way perhaps that we would like to show up? Okay, I, I believe that this will be an excellent, response for you it okay. falls into the next se segment generational trauma mm. if you allow me to go there because yeah. i'm sure you will love it okay perfect thank you yeah i want to make sure we i want to go into that and then i'm yeah. going to answer that question for you thank you so much okay i'm turning back over to you any more questions before we go into the generational trauma there's uh some comments um that terrence has uh, share Terrence, thank you so much. So Ian and Aiden, don't let Terrence out chat, y'all. <laughs> yeah, Aiden done, he did something. Aiden did drop something once, you know, but Ian, let's hear from you. So, uh, cause we, every, your, your voice matters. Your voice matters here. So you comment, question, your voice matters. So Terrence is saying that you're talking so much truth. Um, he says there is trauma, racist response to it and re-traumatizing. It's like, we must even protect our trauma. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. Yes, Terrence, right. That, that's mm -hmm. a good statement. Truth is healing and therapeutic just as justice. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like that Terrence, when you say we must protect our trauma. You know, because doesn't mean protecting it doesn't necessarily mean holding on to it and trying to keep it, but protecting, you know, could be trying to understand it, you know, or, or holding on to it to create a space where it can be mm -hmm. understood. Exactly. You know? um, yeah. I wanted to go back to one thing here mm -hmm. because uh, I believe Venice and, and Terrence both kind of said something to that. So I want to kind of go back sure. to about the therapy piece mm, right yeah. and having that platform that space mm -hmm. okay so i'm going to use because i love to use real case examples because a lot of people are not getting it and they need to get it mm -hmm. for example i had uh, a lawsuit right and i was going through you can't even imagine because the suit is right here with my management so I'm here in the harassment, multiple complaints and blah, 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 blah. So 
I'm also a social worker preparing to sit for my social work license. The defendants, what they do is they look for things like mental health. So I had to stay away from that. Okay, so what would you like me to do? Lawyers, on the other hand, and I had to help them to understand that, is um, you have a business to run. You want money. You in the Hamptons, I'm trying to get there too. However, I have to protect my sanity and I'm not going to allow people to just walk all over me. So I'm done listening to you, what you want. And I took them back to court. And I'm also a landlord tenant mediator because I had enough of you. Okay, so it ended well, but it was trying to get them to really understand. And when I'm pouring my heart out to you and I included all of the links, you know, someone was murdered in my building. Then January 1st, someone was on a roof wanting to jump off. This person, they let them out the hospital. They came back a few days later, held their girlfriend hostage with a gun and raped on the first floor. And then a week later, the police killed them right here in the building. And then I come out, there's yellow tape and then someone else got shot. So it's all of this nonsense going on around me. And so your response is, I appreciate your patience. Really, dude? So what would you like me to do? You're protecting the money, but I have to live here. I can only take but so much. But because I have those tools, I know how to go outside and I will be okay, but I am still human. And so what does that look like for people that don't have those coping skills? What well again, they don't have a ham hock in the backyard. What would you like them to do? Because they're gonna explode and either they're gonna hurt someone or hurt themselves. And if they have that platform, right? But someone on the outside looking in, you may see me as an angry black person. And I was angry because I want my money that thank God I got it now. But there was all the stuff that I was going through. What do I do with this? Because I'm also, again, sitting for my social work license. You don't want that tracking you. So when you have people that wants to sign you up for therapy, those mm. are some of the things that they're missing. Mm. And I'm not trying to steer people away from mental health. If you really need it, if you feel that you need medication, then I encourage you to seek that. But it, explore other options as well, because people are so willing to just throw, a, it, no, I'm not crazy at all. I don't need anything to help me sleep. Mm -hmm. I just need someone to talk to, someone that can really understand me for me, not the angry Black woman, but just as the sheen, a woman of color that has a lot of different things going on. And I have some people that when I speak to them, I shut down and I know I'm never going to speak to them like that again. Oh, you have so much going on. And that they try to make it something that it's not. I know I have a lot going on and that's why I shared it with you. But trust me, I'm in control. Because I've learned how to divide those things in that plate. So for me, it's like, um, how many outfits can you wear one day, right? Or if you're going on a trip, or even women in general, we like to pack a lot of stuff in our pocketbooks, right? Half the time, we don't even get this stuff that's, that's, that's in our pocketbook. How much makeup and lipstick do you really need, right? Yeah. And so this is what I, I use, little things like that. And it's just really finding what can work for that person. That becomes their medication. Like me, I have a TV in my bathroom. I go in there and I watch movies because that's what worked for me because I close the door and I block everything out because I have to do that for me so that I can keep it together. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to go and talk to someone and you're sitting there psychoanalyzing me. Oh, does she, you sound very angry or you want me to draw a puzzle or boil up a little <laughs> issue. It's insulting to us. Right. Right. And then right. that's what they have to understand. It's insulting. I didn't come here to roll up balls of toilet tissue and just throw them. Or I had someone on my LinkedIn, and I'm not going to lie to you. I've kicked them off and I blocked them. You told me that you work with piece, people of color and you want them to use cheers. Like if someone raped you, you're going to hit the chair. We're not going to do that. 
okay? It's insulting to us and we don't have time to play with you. We came for service. We really want help, but not to be insulted, which is, that's something for a child. I'm not your child. Yeah. That, that's what they have to understand. That's really powerful, Desheen, because I think that leads us to a question that Ian has posed. It's kind of a question slash comment, and that leads us to our next topic you know, the trauma embedded communities. So I want to read to you what um, Ian has written and also let you tie that in. So okay. Ian says, and Ian, thank you for participating. Ian <laughs> says, thank you. This is a very important topic. I'm thinking about application in the confines of our environment that poses a great challenge. The confines of, of, of our environment, they pose a great challenge. How does, young, how does a young person change their mind, um, have the help that they need or get the help they need, given that, what that their environment hasn't changed? You know, what advice can you give to people struggling who are looking to escape, looking to get help, looking to get counseling, looking to deal with their trauma? Okay, so for me, and I, I talk to a lot of young people because you have to be able to connect with them on a level that they understand without insulting them. So for example, I see young girls on a train a lot, right? And they're cursing and they're carrying on, right? And I'll say, you know what? You're very beautiful. Because you know that a lot of that is attention-seeking behaviors. They have low self esteem See, they just want somebody to listen to them. So this is, is, is your approach. And then helping them to change their social circle. That's key. Because it's, it's a lot of peer pressure because they want to belong to something. And so a lot of the resources that we have for use, and again, I'm not prejudiced, and, but if you have these things being uh, organized and, and, you know, facilitated by people that's not of color, you're not going to be able to reach them. And you have to allow them, even though you are the expert, you have to allow them to see people, I'm an expert. No, 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 no. They are the expert. They know what they need. They just need to know how to get there in a way that doesn't cause them to get killed, doesn't cause them to get arrested. That's what they need, not you telling them what to do. That's the big problem. We are sick and tired of people telling us what to do. Slavery is over and that is the mindset. And so if you can't get that, they're not gonna listen to you because me as an adult, I won't even listen to you because again, I don't want you psychoanalyzing me and writing up a bunch of stuff on what you think is wrong with the shame because you don't know anything about me. I'm telling you what's wrong with me, but you want to form your own opinion. That is the same with our kids. You have to give them the floor. You stay the expert, but create things around what they're sharing. Allow them to be the young leader. Let them take the lead and they will tell you what they want. And you, as the expert, as the adult, you craft out uh, uh, programs and things around that that they can connect to. But for them, they did this. They took the lead. And they, they, they feel good. Like, wow, you know, I'm so proud of you. You know, he helped create this or she helped create this. And this is her work. That's what they, they want. Because they know there's a problem, but they just don't know what to do. And so, you know, if things are not right at home and they're not getting that support and then they go outside, a lot of our kids, even adults, and I see it all the time because I do a lot of community assessment, they inject themselves and stuff. I seen a lady the other day in the, in the uh, laundromat, she just injected herself to the point that she got a pair of handcuffs, totally unnecessary. Mm. And it, a lot of it comes from boredom. A lot of it comes from a need to belong. So when they see something going on with the police, they gravitate to that because that's excitement, because that's all they know. That's all they're seeing in their neighborhoods. So we need to show them something else, but stuff that they can identify with, not uh, boiling up little rolls of tissue and all of that kind of nonsense, because they're going to look at you like you have 10 heads and know they're not going to listen to you. And it enrages them. But if you allow them to take the lead, you know what? 
come here, Johnny. What's going on with you? Like, what's what's really good with you? That's the language that they speak. That's what you have to do with them. And they'll tell you, no, because my mom, she keeps smoking this weed and blah, 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 blah. And this is where you reach them because you are learning about them. How are you doing today, John? I love those sneakers. Those sneakers are nice. And you connect. You connect with them. So what you're doing is building up their self-esteem, that trust. Because one thing I do know, people of color, whether young or old, once we, and that's that gut instinct, and we don't trust you, no, we're not going to talk to you. You know, that that is real powerful. Ian, I hope that was helpful, you know, in terms of that. What I wrote down was the approach. We have to really think about the approach and we get to decide what a good approach for them. You know, meaning, like you said, Desheen, you saw some ladies on the train acting up, being loud, you know, about they, they're looking for attention. They're looking for belonging. So we can give them the right attention, you know, exactly. and acknowledging them. You know, I just want to acknowledge your hair is beautiful. I, I really love your hairstyle, you know, or your <laughs> beautiful smile, you know. You know yeah, oh, just, the people on the train. Oh, okay, people on the I'm, train. Yeah, but just, you too, the sh- you too, the sh- Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. But then, no, no, no apologies. But I'm just but stand but real with you know the way that we approach people, mm-hmm. and I think the the youth deserve the same. They deserve a high level of acknowledgement. And I think that sometimes as adults, we, we in our heads walking around like you got to earn this to be able to get seen and heard like this. No, they're human beings. They're people. Absolutely. <laughs> if you- when you get a chance, um, my LinkedIn, Black mm-hmm. Leaders Without Limits. Mm-hmm. I did, um, uh, I believe it was uh, Styles of Communication. And I spoke about a person not of color and there were three people of color, young adults, kids on a train. They were a little loud, but they were into their own thing. And a white lady says to them that they're acting like little monkeys. Oh, I knew that if I did not interject, they was going to kill her on that train. <laughs> and so a lot of people follow that post that I put out. And mm. so I said, miss, please come over here and sit down next to me. And so she comes, she sits down next to me and she starts talking about them to me. Mm. So finally mm. I looked at her and I says, miss, am I not a person of color? Mm-hmm. And she continued. And so finally I said, you know what? I want you to shut up. And here's the reason why. And I laid it out for her. You know, she thanked me and wanted to, me to create a course for her about how to communicate with Black people. Wow. And the kids, wow. they thanked me when they was getting off the train. And I explained to them. And he's like, yeah, because we was going to go in on her. And, my, and I said, well, I'm glad that you mm-hmm. did. Mm-hmm. I'm very glad that you did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, but again, you have no right to tell our kids that they're acting like little monkeys. You way out of line. Yeah. Yeah. Even if that's how you felt, you have no right to say that to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is where, because I know where that would have went. Three young dogs attacked the white woman on the train and it went somewhere else. And I didn't want to see that. And so I had to immediately diffuse that situation because I know what the end result will be. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that was powerful. Like that. that was, that was powerful. Um, would you speak to the I'm going to drop everybody in the chat. I am mm-hmm. searching on the LinkedIn page. So I'm going to be dropping some links in the chat. Um, I just put it in there now, the eyes on power mm-hmm. of her company page. And we'll look for, I'm going to look for that, um, for your newsletter on there as well. Mm-hmm you know, and drop it in the chat. So I want everybody to stay focused <laughs> and not yeah. go off and start searching, you know, trying to find that. But if so, you wouldn't mind sharing the Shane media, because, you know, how does media play, you know, into, you know, the trauma experiences, you know, that we're having, because I'm looking at, you know, trauma embedded communities. Um, how does that play? And I, I want to throw social media in there too. How does that play into, the traumatization that's happening in the black community or that you've seen, you know, um, media, media has caused. I've gotten to the point that I actually talk to the TV when I see certain stuff. <laughs> right. Right. Me too. <laughs> Anybody else throw hand, hands up, show, show hands. You guys just put your hand emoji up. How many of you talk to the TV or talk to your phone when you see news highlights on your phone or they drop up in your feed and you just, 
shaking your head. Anybody put the, put your hands up. Use the emojis. Yeah. Yeah. Terrence said, or curse at it. Yeah. It's just too much. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, thanks Aiden. I'm yes. Not, Aiden says, yes. I'm not going to get into no name stuff, but sure. when you go there, I even, I have a picture of New York city upside down. And I, and I blew our mayor up. Like I'm voting for me. I'm my own president. I'm my own mayor. And I'm not, I'm gonna leave it at that. But uh, I'm just saying that it's just too much. It's too much. So is this about bragging rights or is this about really helping your people? Because we really need some help. We really do. And I believe it's only going to get worse if we do not, you know, step up and start helping one another. Because when I, cut my TV on in the news, it, it, it just breaks my heart when I'm seeing so many of our youths that they're just getting killed. They haven't even begun to enjoy life. When you have people that go to the store and they, they don't return, you know, look at what happened in Buffalo, the supermarket, that was horrific. You know, um, so it's the media, um, there's one thing that, you know, I've watched, for years, way before the pandemic, I believe I want to say it's Channel 5. Mm -hmm. I, they're kind of racist to me. And I say that because what I don't like is, um, you know, for example, um, you know, um, a woman, so-and-so was found, or guy, so-and-so was found dead, blah, 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 blah. He had an extensive criminal. What the hell does his record have to do with him being killed? He's a human right. being. Just leave it there. And I hate that. Because do you say that about a white person? Mm -hmm. And that yeah. bothers me. Because that is a human being, whether they have a record or whatever. The person was found dead. You should be out looking for who's responsible for that. That's someone's child. Right. Yes, that, that labeling, that labeling that we see, you know, on the media, because when you mm -hmm. label people, it just automatically brings up some trauma, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. brings up some trauma, you know, when you do that, because you start to uh, associate yourself with that. I don't even think we mean to, right. but I think it's, it's conditioning, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's the conditioning component of it, you know, yeah. that does that. And another thing, too, is with um, because we have to take accountability for our behaviors. You know, this thing mm. with the video where they're videoing like two mm. girls fighting in the laundry and mm. out of their clothes. It's disgusting. And so if we are doing this to each other, what is the message that you're sending to society mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when we speak to Black Lives Matter? Yeah, yeah. And so that's something that, you know, we have to work on and help others, you know, understand that there's no human in that. It's really it's, not. It's, it's not. It, it's not at all. There's no humor in that. But I think that what it goes back to is an example of um, the person is really crying out for something. I'm looking at my notes, like the person is really crying out for help and mm -hmm could be depending on the environment that they're coming from that that in, that is a way that they get help is violent right. acting mm -hmm. violently or acting out you know in violence um you know and or it could be the person's last ditch effort right. you know to say i need some help nobody is hearing me or paying attention to me or giving mm -hmm. me the compassion showing me any compassion right. you know around that and so now mm -hmm. i I've, I've got to i got to do something really drastic and yeah, you know, and a to, lot of to that get... too is you know some of it is attention-seeking behaviors. Yeah, like yeah. I need to feel important. Acknowledge me. Yeah, acknowledge yeah. you. Absolutely. I, 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 I'm looking at the time, and I do yep. want to okay. answer your question. Yep. That I tabled, and so this falls into the generational trauma. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use mm -hmm. the real experience, give that coping technique, and to answer it aligns with the question that you had asked okay okay so my mom she turned 98 years old and oh. two days two days later she went to sleep in my arms oh. and i was very disturbed that my own siblings you see them on a the camera 
not even two hours after they moved my mother's body, they went into a home, they stole, they ripped up all of my pictures, left them all over the bed that I had there. It was just horrific, horrific, horrific. And so they had this private viewing right up here where I am. And I didn't go because I'm not going to be a part of that charade. Mm -hmm. However, when I had my own private viewing, I was really disgusted by what I saw. And um, I had someone that they offered me a gun. Did I want to go in there and kill him? Of course, that's my mama. Mm -hmm. But what is that going to do for me after? And it's again, it's to get people to think you will feel good in the moment. But what happens Mm -hmm. after? Mm. But you know what I did? I reached out to some people in Italy and I had a pair of sneakers made, named after my mother, and they went viral. They was featured in Harper Bazaar magazine. Mm. And what I do with all the money is I offer funeral scholarships in honor of my mother so that no one ever has to experience that again. Okay. But Mm. I have a new book that's going to be, you know, I'm sharing more tips about that because the thing is that we know about defamation character. And the thing is that you don't allow people to draw you out. You don't Mm. make it about them. I am not responsible for their behavior. I am responsible for how I respond. So I had a beautiful celebration of life for my mother on my birthday. That was the greatest birthday ever. And it's just keeping her legacy alive. And so it's getting people to, to, and I mean, I was really traumatized by that. Um, But again, Mm. How you respond to situations. Sometimes, you know, family, I, I'm like, what is that? Sometimes family can be the worst, but what can you do? Because mm. I've met strangers that have become family members. It doesn't have mm. to be blood. Right. But the point that I want to make is that you have to stay in control. Every time I'm in a better space now, but there's times that I walk up the block past that funeral home and the people that work there they're saying hello to me because they think I'm such a nice lady I got my mask on and not knowing in the back of my mind I wish I could kill them after seeing my mother like that you know Mm -hmm. you don't know Mm -hmm. what I'm going through when I walk by there but I know that that's not the right thing to do right 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 so for a while I used to just cross the street and walk Mm -hmm. on the other side Mm -hmm. but I had to make sure that I could be okay with that. And if I continue to hold on to that, it's going to eat me up. So just yeah. this July marks the two years my mother passed. I went down to the pier and I released balloons at 150 on July 13th wow. so that I could begin my healing. Because wow. I mean, I was messed up. I'm not going to share a lot about the book. Sure. But remember, sure. she passed in my arms in the bed. I slept in my living room for eight months Mm. and I just cry and cry and cry because I felt like I let my mother down. Mm. How was I supposed to know that they would do something like that? How do you prepare for something like that? You can't, but do you go around and be bitter? No, you add that to your portfolio. Knowing that if you can go through that and I'm still standing, right? They're still Mm -hmm. broke. They're still broke. I'm still standing and I'm still making a difference in the lives of other people, keeping my mother's legacy alive. Mm -hmm. You don't give Mm -hmm. people your energy. You don't respond the way people expect you to respond. Mm -hmm. And I'm angry, but it's what you do about it. And I chose to write and the sneakers. Mm -hmm. And I'm working on a skincare line behind the scenes after my mom's soft as a woman that she was. Mm. My mother was in the helping profession. Mm. And it's about her. That, that's, that's my queen. She's sitting right there. That, that's, that's my beautiful, queen. Beautiful, beautiful. Watching over all of the plants, everything. <laughs> I love it. I yeah, love it. I think finding that balance. Yeah. You know, because my coping skill may not work mm. for Venice. And so for me, when I work with people, the first thing I do is I find out as much as I can about you. And I draw from that to create something that will resonate for you. Mm. Because what Desheen does may not work for Venice, but it doesn't mean that I'm not able to help Venice. And if I see that I absolutely cannot, I'm not going to take Venice's money and send her on a wild goose chase because 
you know, I want to be the six figure coach. Mm-hmm. This is not mm-hmm. a joke. Trauma is not a joke. Ooh, we need a t shirt for that one, Desheen. <laughs> <laughs> we do. We need a t shirt that says trauma is not a joke. We no, need to, we need to have that like every sticker, bumper sticker on mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of different media interaction. You right. Know, trauma serious. is not a joke. And yeah, black trauma is very serious. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and just to close out with that, um, and again, I am not prejudiced or any of those things, you know, but um, it kind of hurts me when I hear people that are not of color, they say a lot of things about people of color. However, we have a lot of trauma, but, you know, the suicide piece and going on the roof and, you know, driving a plane through the building and all that stuff, that's not who we are. Right. We need a different kind of platform. Mm -hmm. Platform for people that look like us, Mm -hmm. sounds like us, and that really understands us. And then open it up to people that are not of color so that we can offer you the training if you really wanna help us. See, that's how that's supposed to be working because you are not an expert for me if you don't understand me. Every survivor of trauma, that's the expert, not you. You're right. They know what they need. They just help, they need help putting it together not to be psychoanalyzed, not to be called the angry black woman or the angry black men, because again, we need our own platform. You really, really got to get it. And they don't. Yeah. It's unfortunate, but they don't. It really is. And, and we want to, again, acknowledge, I want to read Anne's you know, statement slash question, but definitely okay. acknowledging WOCPSCN for, for today's conference. You know, this is part two is this is a platform you know, Mm -hmm. to be able to talk about it and to be safe, you know, Mm -hmm. in talking about it. No judgment here. Your comments are welcome. Uh, Your contributions to the conversation are welcome because that's how we start to heal, you know, is when we start to talk about, you know, what's important to us, you know, as a community. So Ian posted a comment slash question. Thank you. We have to normalize getting help getting help for mental health, acknowledging that Black people are suffering from trauma, PTSD, post-traumatic slave syndrome, Mm -hmm. managing how to survive, living under a terrorist state, dealing Mm -hmm. with daily discrimination at work, in Mm -hmm. public, at the bank, et cetera, and and take steps towards uh, to begin healing from our trauma. The conversation must be normalized and acknowledged by the larger white society. How do we begin the conversation? Um, how do we begin that conversation with the larger white society? And I think you kind of spoke about that just a few moments ago, Desheen, is the, the trauma, um, you know, people that are going through trauma that are coming on the other side are the experts, you know, and to stop allowing, um, receiving <laughs> resources from communities outside of our community that say they specialize in trauma. Well, you exactly. might, but do you specialize in my trauma? You right. know, that's, that's the question. So I think that's a way that we could, you know, definitely um, start that conversation is not allowing others to, yeah. to train us and, and it, teach and us. And it's not being mean about it because, no, um, right. you know, on, on my LinkedIn, um, you know, I picked up a lot of people following me because I had to shut them down, like um, on um, Black History Month. They try to take over. No, it's not about you. And that's when they had something going on about the Asian. I get it. But right now, this is Black History Month. Get up <laughs> off this platform. <laughs> but I'm just saying it's stuff like that. And where a lot of people was like, you know, some of them, they just set in their ways and they're just racist. And we got to call it for what it is. And for me, again, I'm a realist. I'm not going to sugarcoat it if you got a problem with it. See you later. Bye. I'm not going to hurt if I lose one subscriber. This is not the platform for you. This is a platform for my people to express about because the newsletter talks about the challenges of people of color, the struggles. Mm -hmm. And I open it up to people not of color as long as you understand the mission. But now when you get up there and you go with some other stuff, I kick them off and I block you. Because yeah. no, it's not about you. And I'm not having you come on my platform and try to take over well, what the hell you think you know about us because you don't know nothing about us. And I think that you need to keep it moving. And I put them out. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah I love that hard, ba- hard boundaries. They will take over. And again, it doesn't, it, it, it takes away from our platform where it no longer is our platform. And that was the whole purpose of it. You need to understand our struggles. The same thing with business. We're not here to get played. We don't have family that gave us their 401 to start our business. We took our hard-earned money to open up our business. And we're not here for you to try to take us for a ride. And it's up to us to try to be a more kind, compassionate to one another and help each other out. You know, when I first started the company and I see all these six and seven and eight-figure coaches, how do they do that? You're no smarter than me and I figured it out. And I'm Mm -hmm. right in that ballpark with you. And it's not in one setting. So it's like, don't believe the hype. But again, it's a part of marketing. I get it. But it's trying to understand that. But it's us too, because we're very selfish. Help your sister. Help your brother if you know something. I do it all the time. I got some people I know that you really don't like me, but I still help you. Because deep down inside it's not that you don't like me my sister is that you're not comfortable with what looks back at you in the mirror mm. when you look in it i love me i'm the most beautiful queen that god created i don't care what you think about me i outshine the sun i'm gorgeous <laughs> and if you, don't, if you don't feel like that about you and it's getting our people there you know uplifting people you know, sister, I'm, I'm, I'm loving them glasses. I feel them shoes. Oh, you look very cute. You are so pretty. It's okay to do that to our people. Yeah. And, I, and I and encourage that. I'm telling you, I talk to people all of the time. When I see people angry, you know, I'll get in front of them and go, yoo-hoo, because I don't want to get them from behind. What's going on, my sister? She was going off on the phone about the guy cheating on her. I was able to get her off the phone because the person you're talking to is not your friend. Chances are they're lonely. Mm. They want you to be like them. Mm. So I started a conversation with her and I played devil's advocate. She knows that he's cheating. How? You went into his phone. I'm a little confused because usually when you're looking for something, you find that you're happy. So I don't understand <laughs> what the of me trying to tell her if you don't go on people's stuff, you wouldn't bump into that. And there's no law that men cannot have females as associates. It doesn't mean that they're sleeping together. I had right. somebody call and curse me. I want to fight me. And I'm doing relationship coaching to help you. <laughs> but I think that was an example. That person looking in that phone was an example of trauma, the lingering trauma, because that clearly that's a trust issue. And so that person, perhaps she may have some trauma around trust. Taking baggage from old relationships into the new, and that's that trauma. And before you go into that, you have to address that trauma because what you're doing is just packing it up and taking it with you. You have to let it go. So you need that platform, that outlet. How do I get rid of this? If I'm going into a new Mm. relationship, Mm. a new job, a new community, Mm. then it has to be fresh all the way around i can't be bringing you know when i buy my house what happened in the building because i'm gonna yeah. be afraid of everybody around me where i move at mm-hmm. Ooh, that's, if they, that's if they at my other job i'm gonna be afraid of anybody i work with that i'm a suspect so you have to find a way to you know and it doesn't mean that you're crazy and sometimes other people make us feel that way like I don't really want to share, you know, the experience, how I'm really feeling, because I don't want people to look at me funny or that I'm paranoid or or things like that. You know, this is real for me. Yeah, the trauma is real. Because I have to do something because what I'm doing is just I'm parking it. Mm. I'm parking and I'm masking it, you know, and you have to wash the mask off sometime. Right. And so you just taking this everywhere you go and it's finding a way to let that go and it takes me back to needing our own platform those round table discussions where we are just free to be ourselves what's really going on my sister what's really going on my brother how can we get past this we need that we do we absolutely do you know i want to uh ian had a second part to his question and we got two new messages i want to get those in so ian asks how do we normalize getting help in school, church, and work? So what are your thoughts on that? How do we normalize getting help in school, church, and work? 
for me, again, it's that platform, us creating, it's, it's like FUBU, for us, by us. Mm -hmm. And I say that because it, with the schools, and again, I'm not prejudiced. Mm -hmm. But when you have in the schools, you're throwing mental health in there because that's part of politics, the budget. That's what you want. I may not want my kid involved with no mental health, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that my child should not be able to get help. And when you have white social workers that's trying to talk to my child mm. or trying to talk to me, it's not going to work. That's one area because mm -hmm. you need people, again, that look like us, that understand us, that come from trauma and better communities, and they identify with a lot of things that we are going through. We don't want where you're turning your nose up at us. Because you never lived in a hood. So you're not going to get it. I don't care what you look at on the internet. I don't care what you see in the media. If you haven't actually lived in it, you're not going to get it. And when I try to explain it to you, don't be writing down that she was very angry today or she was agitated. Because then I don't want to talk to you no more. So that's a part of with the school system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. I kind of see half of that. Um, um, I want to speak to that. Um, actually, just yesterday, <laughs> I had someone up, you know, Desheen, you're very good with this. You should work in the school. Me personally, I don't want to work in the school. Mm -hmm. I don't. Because I, me, I just wouldn't feel safe there. Um, I don't think that the schools should be like a jail. But there's too much of our kids bringing guns into schools. That's scary. Yeah. So we have to address that. What is causing that? Is it some type of theme or, you know? And so I think it's really, it, it, there's a lot of layers here with that. Yeah. With the, when we talk about the youths and the juveniles, because, you know, it's that and the piece where a crime is a crime. And so... When we have someone that goes into a supermarket, predominantly black neighborhood, and you shoot all these people and kill them, now you got a mental health record. Well, you know, mental health history, but with a black kid, I'm not hearing that. Right. So right. that is a concern for me. You want to charge them as an adult and throw them under the bus forever in a day, and that's it. Um, so it's it's really again having these discussions. And making real plans and the kids have to be involved because what's happening, you have these politicians with all this big budget and they're doing this for our youth and doing it, but they don't have a voice. This is what you want. Yeah. How do you know that that's what they want? And it's really working with them. And so, um, you know, it's really trying to understand that piece, you know, and taking it back to the school training mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know you bring up a good point um you know on that involving the youth i think that's really important it's kind of been a theme um two-part theme to that i've heard from you in this conversation is um number one first one is self-assessment you know we really do get to look within ourselves mm -hmm. um, because we know inherently we know first you know what trauma um, is affecting us or showing up in our lives Mm -hmm. And we get to really be truthful and honest with ourselves about what that trauma, and there's nothing wrong with telling yourself the truth. Like you said, the way you look in the mirror and acknowledge yourself for being gorgeous, you know, mm -hmm. for being, you know, brighter than the sun and that you're here. But we also get to look in the mirror and say, hey, I'm struggling right now. I'm having a hard time right now. And mm -hmm. this is what's coming up that I can see so far. So I need some help, you know, and, but you got to start there assessing first and then going after the help that you want. Um, and you figuring that help out because sometimes we go after help and it may not be the right help. We have to continue going until we find what we need. Don't give up. Don't give up on that. Right. And another thing is not to cut you off. With, sure, with, okay. uh, this is true for our use and it's yes. true for us. And yes. it's true for us that when we come to you for service or potential service or you we're referred by the school counselor to go to the mental health in the school. And when you, excuse me, Venice, I just got to mm -hmm. take this call. Sure. It mm -hmm. shuts you down. 
because what I'm talking to you about is not important. You taking that call is more important, right? So now I don't want to talk to you no more. But so now I'm an angry black person. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. you just dismissed me. I came to you with a real problem, my trauma, and you just dismissed me to take a call. Yeah. And it's our people too, because I see it all the time. Wait, let me just text my boyfriend back. Yeah, yeah. And it's that training of how we work with one another and to offer this training in the schools because they need to get it. We yeah. want to be respected. We are demanding our respect, but we have to do it in a non-threatening way. Yeah. But you have got to understand us you have got to let us have our own platforms. This way you can learn from these youths and you can learn from us. And then you can come on board and try to work with us. But as yeah. long as you continue to psychoanalyze and put what you think is needed for us, it's never going to work. Yeah, it's, it's never going to work. I want to put this in and then I want to open it up for any additional questions as we wind down our time. Deshane, we could talk all day. <laughs> <laughs> We can talk, we can order DoorDash and hang out on Zoom because this is such an important conversation. And there are so many layers, you know, to discussion on this. I'm going to, as I pose this last, uh, not last, but as I pose this question to Desheen, I'm going to circle back everyone. I'm going to drop in her LinkedIn content. We had some new people that joined us. Thank you for joining us. Um, and if you're joining in the middle of this discussion, um, please be mindful to keep an eye out when the replay comes out so you can watch the replay and catch all of this from the beginning, as well as the day before and other presenters. But let's talk about trauma at work. How do we, you know, get support at work for trauma? You know, how do, how do we, you know, we grown, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, in this environment, different personalities, different cultures, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, we spend the most of our time working, even, even if it's from home, we still have this deep connection with people that we work with. How do we get, how do we get help in work? Okay, so like for me, what I, I what I, I I say to people, because when they say community, they think of just like the neighborhood. Your job is your community. That becomes your community. That's a little community. The people yeah. that you work around. Mm -hmm. And they have these, um, I forgot the name of them. These kind of like, uh, not self-help, but it's something along those lines where uh, you get help within your job and stuff like, like that. Like ERG, like employee resource groups? Something like that, absolutely. Okay. Okay. But people tend to shy away from that because you don't really know, they say confidential, but you don't really know where that information is going to go. And you, again, you want that safe space to share. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I do know, uh, like for us, mm -hmm. we tend to... Like when I worked in the field before I started my company, I never, oh, I'm sorry to turn this down. I never do a social hour. I said, no, I'm sorry. I, I don't drink because you have to keep those boundaries in place. That's mm -hmm. one, you, cause you know that, and you're not, you can be cordial, but you're not there to make friends because if me and Venice, we friends, we go, we go to the club, we hang out. But now Venice gets a promotion. Well, when she's giving out directives, it don't apply to Jasheen because that's my girl. That's my homie. But you gave me a task to do, right? And so now I become angry. Or I come to work. And Jasheen is always bubbly, but I noticed like last week she has kind of like withdrawn. Is paying attention to your colleague. Sister, you all right? What's going on? You want to talk about something? Because you don't know, that's what we call a silent sufferer, what's happening with this person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't go to the next person in the cubicle, I don't know what's going on with Venice, girl. She said, no, you help your sister because you're going to shut Venice down even further and you'll never know what's going on with Venice. So some of those coping skills needs to be trained mm -hmm. inside of organizations so yeah. that they can be offered to the employee. Yeah. Because that's, you know, I have a course actually around that. Trauma in the workplace and speaking the language, mm -hmm. communication skills. Mm -hmm. Because if you really don't understand, right? And 
you know, all my life, uh, this is an example, it's not true, but it's an example, this one. Mm -hmm. All my life, you know, growing up and my father, I'm a guy, my father is, you know, boy, you, or my mother, you know, boy, you're going to be just like your father. You're going to grow up to be nothing. So mm -hmm. I grew up, I grew mm -hmm. up believing this because my mom is angry with my dad. It really has nothing to do with me, mm -hmm. but I'm getting the backlash of it because I still live at home. Mm -hmm. Now I'm in the workforce. I work and I have a supervisor that keeps telling me that I keep making stupid mistakes. Mm -hmm. That's the trigger because I'm remembering this. Yes at home and I might turn around and spaz on you because you don't understand that you're insulting me right now. Right. Right. Those kind of things, the language that we use, because we know that uh, employees are most productive when they feel appreciated. Mm -hmm. Yes. And when they feel a part of, you know, I, I did a post. A lot of people like that is about the quiet quitting. Some people mm. say you're running. Yes, you know, I thought, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not running is that we had enough of you. We had yeah, enough right, of you. Right. And so, right. We're not going to take any more from you. And we are moving on before this gets ugly. That's what we're doing because we don't want that stigma, the angry black woman. So we know when we've had enough, when we've reached our mental health ceiling. However, for those that are not as fortunate to move on or they really may not want to move on, is how do you make a safe space yeah. at work to deal with your trauma? Yeah. Um, you can take small breaks, you know, within mm -hmm. reasons so that you don't get a pink slip. You can start a journal. Mm. Encourage people to smoke. I do. But if you smoke cigarettes when you go on your smoke break, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You just kind of think things back. Like me, sometimes I write emails when I'm mm -hmm. fired up, but I don't send them and I just let them sit there. And then you go back two or three days later, you read that email. You might not want to send that email to your supervisor because you know that's your job. Yeah. Yeah. So some form of release and mm -hmm. trying mm -hmm. to get it up and out so that it's not bottled in you. Right. Or you, you know, know the supervisor is very ignorant. They don't have the training. So when this supervisor is calling me stupid, they're really saying I'm smart as hell. Excuse my French. Yeah. You turn that language around. Mm. Turn mm -hmm. it around because at the end of the day, remember, you will get the end of the stick. You have to be okay. Mm -hmm. And stop letting people get in your head. It's easier said than done, but those are just different kind of techniques not balling up tissue and no yeah yeah you know sometimes when people say things to you hear it different mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know hear it different because at the end of the day after five o'clock you don't have to deal with this food right? all you need is all you need is your paycheck so you don't even see him or her but you keep that game face on good morning mr so-and-so uh, and you do your job in the back of your mind you're making plans for your exit quiet yes. quitting for yes. your exit because I had enough of you and I know I'm going to explode at some point so I need to do what I got to do to get away from you but I'm not going to allow you to fire me give me a pink slip so while I'm here every time you say stupid wow I'm so beautiful you call me a queen in my head yeah I like that I like reframing reframing yeah. that language so that you can be able to um get through you know, you need to do that. And that's not a lie when you reframe it and say, if somebody says that you're so stupid, you're like, I'm a queen. That's not a lie. That's really affirming what you really believe about yourself. Absolutely. And we have to be the first ones to do that. What I, We just got a grace of getting 10 more minutes, everybody. Um, <laughs> so we can talk because this is so good. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I want to definitely open it up for questions. What I will say is a, I'm also a certified career management coach. What mm -hmm. I will say to individuals about the workplace you know, check your benefits, check your benefits to see what, um, what tools are in your benefits kit that you can access to mm -hmm. get support, to get mental support, mental health support. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of companies have that. You got to, you literally have to almost dig deep to find it. 
but it's mm -hmm. in there. So check your benefits department and see if you have benefits available. Um, employee resource group, you know, could be some companies are very active, some are not, but you find that out and you continue with the next steps. Um, mm -hmm. Also, some companies do offer therapy, you know, where they will pay for therapy, they'll pay for family therapy. Um, mm -hmm. Some companies offer uh, programs, you know, to help with different type of abuses, you know, alcohol abuse. Mm -hmm. um, some of them may offer programs around domestic violence, you right. know, and mm -hmm. so access those benefits and don't be caring about and worrying about somebody knowing your business because you're asking them about that. <laughs> those are well, your I mean, benefits. If it's a part of your benefits, you're entitled. You're to entitled that. to, right. And the other thing, if you're taking a new job, if that's something that you are seeking in the near future for yourself, mm -hmm. check the benefits on that. If you don't see it, ask for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ask for that. So that's what I wanted to add about, you know, helping mm -hmm. in the workplace. Terrence had two comments that I see mm -hmm. pop up. Yes. One kind of went past me a little bit, something Let about violence. It says, why subject yourself to violence if it can be avoided? Um, I'm not sure what he means by that. Are you meaning in the workplace, the example I gave with the supervisor? And then while he's chatting back, uh, Aiden dropped in a comment. He says, um, or they say, sorry, I don't know if it's he or she. They say, I feel that in Liverpool, UK, trauma and racism is mainly in work, including mental health sectors and educational institutions. Mm -hmm. So so, so Aiden, are you saying that that's where the trauma and racism really is, is in the men mental health sectors and in the in, in educational institutions? Just want to make sure we're understanding your comment. So Aiden says, yes. So, wow. And I agree. I yeah. totally, totally agree. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You nailed it. Said it in a nutshell. Because yeah. it's real. It's true. Yeah, that's really tough because that's they're supposed to help us, right? <laughs> okay. Terrence, meaning mm -hmm. wise to jet your... Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Please. No, no, that's okay. No, you're right. Yeah, Terrence is meaning why subject subject yourself to violent work environments. You were talking about coping, different coping mechanisms to sheen, you know, in the environment. So, you know, okay. and how reframing that mm -hmm. so that, you know, as you are planning to make an, a transition, you know, out of right. that. What, what I mean, Terrence, is... Um, not all the time, but there are times where we have to subject ourselves to some things we don't like, mm. but we have a plan in place. Mm. And so it's not intentionally subjecting myself to violence. I just don't have a, a, a choice where I know that if I allow my anger, for example, to take presence and I just walk off my job, I had enough. Okay, so now tomorrow when I wake up, reality is setting in. How am I going to eat? How am I going to pay my bills? Because I let this individual play me out of pocket where I slapped them at work or I just walked off the job. Or, we're not going to do any of that. You plan and have an exit plan and you keep that game face on. And when you leave work, you're still planning, but this is when you're addressing what's going on so that you're prepared for the next day. This is what I'm speaking about when, you know, it's not, again, intentionally, except, you know, subjecting myself to the violence. This is the best that I can do right now, but it's temporary. It's like a band-aid. This is only temporarily for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I know that I have to stay focused. I know about the labels, the angry Black woman, the angry Black man. So less I say is best. So again, when the supervisor is saying things like stupid or stuff like that, I see it. I'm a queen. You know, he's reaffirming how beautiful I am. He's just mad because I don't want him. Whatever is I, I'm putting in my head to right. tune that individual out because I know next week I got a sick day, but I have interviews lined up. Mm -hmm. you, you understand? So, you know, I have to put up with it for a little while, mm -hmm. but I know how much I can take. So I'm putting things in place so that I can get away from that situation. But I also have to be mindful that I'm not bringing the job home with me. Meaning like when I leave, I may get on a train and that could escalate violence right there. 
where somebody may bump me. The train is crowded. Normally I'd be like, no problem, sister, no worries. But I'm angry. You know, supervisors keep calling me stupid. You know, so I'm I'm already geared up. So now I get on the train. And that's what we have to really watch out for, how we take that with us. Mm-hmm. And so I believe, Terrence, that if you have a plan in place. I don't like to look at it as, you know, subjecting myself to, I'm just tolerating it right now because I have to, I have to think about my children or my, my bills and, you know, how I'm going to survive. But again, it's having a backup plan to get away from that situation. I hope that helps. That's helpful, Terrence, in answering your question. So thank you all. Um, I'm sure again, we have, there are more questions. So continue to think of your questions, you know, as you move along to, you know, in this event and put those questions there. I have dropped Desheen's contact information in LinkedIn, her website information in LinkedIn. Please, please go learn more about Desheen and the amazing work that she's doing in the Black community um, and follow her. You know, I love that she does those newsletters and dropping those nuggets. We can continue to learn. Um, So Desheen, thank you so much. And I'm going to turn it back over to Loretta. So she is the sponsor, her organization, and let let us give us some closing remarks. And I just want to say thank you so much, everyone, for your participation, for your questions and your comments, um, and catching the replay, those of you that are catching the replay. um, So that way I can just be honored the rest of the day that I had the opportunity to spend with you. And I learned a lot too, Desheen, so thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. And thank you very much. Vanessa, you did a wonderful job as our moderator. Thank you so very, very much. And Desheen, girl, you are rough, but you real, and I love it. That's that New York flavor going up. You got to be from New York to go that deep. You know what I'm saying? Yes. <laughs> Harlem in the house here, so I'm with you, sis. You know? <laughs> but thank you, thank you all that participated. Your engagement was really critical. And we're excited that we accomplished what we were looking to achieve today because the day was, this is my country when they share their care. And Desheen spoke on that, how the dominant will speak about how we're supposed to perceive our relationship to the trauma that they imploded on us and how it might explode in other perspectives. Please go to the page and while you review, listen to the song, this is my country. Uh, We base this whole platform of this series on Curtis Mayfield and his conscious thinking of Blackness through his prolific songs. The lyrics are there. And if you click the uh, page that states, this is my country at WCPSN at our uh, summit page, you can go directly and listen to that song. Tomorrow we'll be talking about people get ready when being sick and tired is when you are sick and tired. And People Get Ready was released the year of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Americans that were descendants of the slavocratic system were given reason for optimism. However, with the reversal of recent American rights and the new traumas that are occurring, how do the people get ready when the train has been derailed? Mm. Mm. So we're going to be speaking with uh, Dr. Lola Russell. She is health communications at the CDC and prevention. And Dr. Mustafa Ashari is the Dean of the Afro Descendants Institute of African Rights. He's the chief facilitator of African Descent Nation that will take place at the same number line tomorrow at 4.30. Again, thank you so much, my sisters. Vanessa and Desheen, you you brought it. You brought it. Yes, this will be posted on WCPSEN uh, YouTube page and on our site today. Because I know we got to go back in with this. This was something else. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Be blessed. Have a wonderful day. And I'll see you all tomorrow. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Bye now. Bye, everyone.